Hello there. A musical career doesn't really get better than Bob Dylan's. He's one of the best-selling musicians of all time. He won a Pulitzer and a Nobel, and now he's being recognized as a visual artist. But that last accolade took a while. Ain't it just like the night you play tricks when you're trying to be quiet? Back in 1966, Bob Dylan was riding high with hits such as Visions of Joanna and I Want You. Then he was sidelined by a motorcycle accident. While he had to temporarily put down the mic, he picked up a pencil and started drawing. And from that point on, Dylan's interest in visual arts grew stronger. The first time the public got to see one of his artworks was in 1968. That's when the band used this Dylan painting as its cover art for the Music from Big Pink album. And after more than 50 years, the Frost Art Museum in Florida has gathered around 200 of Dylan's works. The Retro Spectrum exhibition features paintings, drawings, ironwork and ephemera. But also his new series called Deep Focus, in which he picked scenes from films and transformed them into paintings. For Dylan, seeing his life work all under one roof is a fascinating experience. I don't really associate them with any particular time or place or state of mind, but view them as part of a long arc, a continuing of the way we go forth in the world and the way our perceptions are shaped and altered by life. But it wasn't until the past two decades that the art world started praising him as a visual artist. Then his first public exhibition took place in Germany in 2007. As for Retro Spectrum, it debuted at Shanghai's Modern Art Museum back in 2019, before the current show in the States. It's dubbed the most in-depth exhibition of Dylan's art, and both museums state that it illuminates the context of his artistic evolution in tandem with Dylan's musical and literary canon. And while the retro spectrum is in full swing, Dylan is out touring because, as he put it, Well, let me welcome Jordana Pomeroy, director of the Patricia and Philip Frost Art Museum. Hi there. It's lovely to have you with us today. Thanks so much. So let's start with this. Tell us what is the importance of this exhibition for you? Why did you think it was necessary to exhibit uh, Bob Dylan's works? Oh, when, um, well, when the creative director of the Modern Art Museum Shanghai, uh, Shai Baitel, came to us with this idea, it was, it was novel for us to think about a singer and his visual output, his visual practice. Uh, and I thought this is very interesting for us because Bob Dylan is an icon. He's a global icon. And I wanted to learn about his visual practice. And once I saw it, I thought this is necessary for the world to see that this is a multifaceted, brilliant man. And we also I, you know, were given the opportunity to debut the show in the USA. So who would say no to that? Okay, well, from your perspective, how has Bob Dylan's obvious excellence in writing, songwriting, and singing figured in the way he has approached making visual art? He's an acute observer. And when you look at his lyrics, which so many of us know, even if we didn't know they were by Bob Dylan, I have a joke, which is every other song has, as it turns out, been written by Bob Dylan. And you realize he appeals to everybody across decades across different ages, different countries. And in the same way, his eye, it has been trained the same way. He has traveled the world. And what he produces in metalwork, on canvas, drawing, is also very appealing to a very wide demographic. He is not, um, nothing is based specifically in one period of time. And he even says that, that when he looks at his own visual practice, 
he sees that there's no specificity to it in terms of time and place. And if you think about his lyrics, that's very much applicable to his lyrics as well. I mean, this might be a tricky one for you, but do you think he's as good in painting and you know, visual arts in general? When I was presented with this, I thought, I can't believe what a great draftsman he is. Or more to the point, I can't believe we've not known about his visual practice. And I asked uh, the artistic director, why is it I've never seen these works before? I never heard about Bob Dylan as a visual artist. I, I've known him as a filmmaker, of course, as a singer, uh, as a Nobel laureate. But what about this? Uh, what is this extraordinary visual practice he has? And uh, the artistic director, Shai, said, he he was he didn't want to show it. He didn't want to um, expose himself, I guess, to the world this way. And he he had to get to a certain point in his life where he felt he could do that. OK, well, you said that he didn't want to expose himself into the world like that. But for this exhibition, how much uh, or how little was he involved in the process? Well, he worked. Uh, primarily with Shai, he was involved. He was very involved, like most artists are involved with their own living artists, of course, are involved with the, the curating uh, uh, of their exhibitions. He had uh, certain works he absolutely wanted to include, in, including the latest series of works, Deep Focus, which are based on uh, film stills. And so he had, a, he had his hand is definitely visible in the exhibition. So, you know, the work is, it's beautiful. I think it's going to be surprising for many to see uh, the variety, to see how he's uh, worked in metalwork. And he takes his work very seriously. You know, he's got, there's some great pictures of him uh, with, you know, a soldering iron and he's, uh, he's got a terrific eye. So I think he, I think his work stands up to any other American artist working today. And what do you think might surprise the audience the most? Well, first that he makes that he makes art. Um, uh, his draftsmanship. He has a, he has a very very he's very he's very good at drawing, which is a way that I judge artists. I I'm very interested in very basic. You know how do they um, how do they draw and how do they sort of translate that into into their painting practice. I think the variety. You know, he's got a, a very keen eye for all sorts of things, roadway signs, as I said, film stills. He's, um, he really captures also, I, I would call it a certain loneliness. He, he does um, focus on the figure and figures are often seen alone, sort of like Edward Hopper. Uh, and it's, it, he, he sort of captures that sense of isolation and solitude that we can all identify with. Where is his artistic career going to go, you think? I mean, are we going to see him get a Turner Prize now, along with the many accolades uh, he's gotten over the years? Well, you know, that's a, I love that. I love that question. I, I doubt he'd be uh, chasing the Turner Prize, although, uh, and as we, you know, he's, he's kind of, um, I think, rather modest, uh, a modest artist. So uh, that, that would not likely be his ambition. I, I believe, well, I can answer that straightforward. This, this show will travel, and it will likely travel to Europe and throughout the U.S. So uh, you'll keep seeing um, iterations of this exhibition. In fact, this exhibition is not exactly the one that was shown at the Modern Art Museum in Shanghai. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a variation on it, so the show itself will evolve. And then thereafter, I think you will start to see his works in museum collections. It's already, of course, privately collected. Many of the works come from private collections that we're exhibiting at the Frost Art Museum, FIU. All right, Jordana Pomeroy, director of the Patricia and Philip Frost Art Museum. It was lovely having you with us today. Thanks so much. <music> director Ridley Scott is famous for high concept science fiction films. He's shifted gears in a new biopic and turned his camera on the fashion industry. Ali Jan has the story. Gucci. 
It was a name that sounded so sweet. If you're looking for outcast dystopian detectives hunting down robots, then this Ridley Scott picture is not for you. Instead, House of Gucci delves into the intrigue and drama surrounding the family of the iconic fashion brand. In this retelling, Patrizia Reggiani marries Maurizio. He's the grandson of Gucci's founder. And through this union, we see how members of the money-making dynasty will do anything to gain power. This kind of biopic is new for Scott. He trades in his bigger-than-life shots of spaceships for office spaces. But the story told in House of Gucci is not that dissimilar from his filmography. Alien, Blade Runner, all had something to say about the darker side of man. They had a point where lead characters were betrayed by their allies in the face of danger or for personal gain. In House of Gucci, the family betrays each other for money. So at its core, this is a movie about human nature. However, reviews say this attempt at storytelling falls into the category of camp partly because of Scott's direction and partly because of the larger-than-life performances. Reportedly, members of the actual Gucci family are not pleased with the way they are portrayed. That may seem a bit odd for some, since critics also point out that the real Gucci family is more outlandish and controversial than what the movie sets them out to be. Nubaina Himid has been creating art for more than four decades, but critics say she doesn't get the attention she deserves. But will a large-scale exhibition change that? Let's see. Lubaina Himid's artistic career began with theatre design, so it's not surprising that the Tate Modern is giving her solo show a theatrical atmosphere. The exhibition includes paintings, installations, drawings, music, and even poems, all reflecting scenes from everyday life. This is an exciting opportunity for the public to see the largest show of Lubaina Hamid's work. Hamid felt it was time for her to display works that explore the untold aspects of history and contemporary life. She didn't want to hear anyone say anything like, this painting is beautiful. Instead, she wanted to maintain a conversation with the audience. She uses a kaleidoscope of materials and objects in her work, including wood, ceramics, and furniture, as a way of appealing to the broadest range of people as possible. This exhibition is a super important one because it really seeks to place the audience at the center of all of its action. Especially after the kind of year that we've had this year, it seems so important because it asks of us lots of questions about our daily encounters with everything that shapes and changes our lives. Himid was born in Zanzibar in 1954. She lost her father when she was just four months old, eventually moving to the United Kingdom with her mother. After studying theater design at the Wimbledon College of Art, she went on to study cultural history. Since the early 1980s, she has constantly worked to reflect the contributions of black artists in cultural life. In 2017, she became the first black woman to win the Turner Prize. But in an interview with CNN, she says her work was ignored for most of her career because the art world largely ignores people of color. I think we have seen a major change in the recognition of black artists. We've seen it at Tate with Frank Bowling a few years ago, him getting a retrospective after many, many decades of producing work, and we're seeing it more and more. It's a positive step. We need to see more of black artists and wider representation within Tate exhibitions. Vibrant figurine paintings centered on black characters, questions printed on the walls, these are Himid's way of engaging with her audience and getting them to think about themselves and their place in the world. And while the organizers of her solo exhibition think that her work is finally getting the attention it deserves, Himid cares more about how the audience feels 
after seeing her work than what the critics think of it. This year's Turner Prize has gone to a group of artists in Northern Ireland. They're called the Array Collective, a group whose work focuses on social activism. It includes a mock pub adorned with banners that the BBC describes as advocating reproductive rights and protesting against conversion therapy. Alec Baldwin says he didn't pull the trigger of the prop gun he was holding when cinematographer Helena Hutchins was killed. Baldwin made the claim to ABC News in his first public response to last month's incident. A police investigation is still underway. A letter written by Charles Dickens is set to go under the hammer in, at Christie's in London. Dickens wrote the four-page note to his friend Sir Joseph Paxton, an architect and MP. The auction house says the artifact is an example of Dickens' superb writing. It is expected to fetch up over $5,000. A painting by Sandro Botticelli is expected to sell for more than $40 million at a Sotheby's auction next month. The painting is titled The Man of Sorrows and depicts Jesus Christ. It's one of the artist's last masterpieces and has been in a private collection for almost 60 years. Late designer Karl Lagerfeld's personal belongings are also going on sale in Monaco. They include the designer's trademark fingerless leather gloves and other items from his wardrobe and home. Sotheby's is offering 1,000 pieces that will be sold over a series of online and live auctions. Let's open the Movie Almanac to 1941 when a film made history during the golden age of Hollywood, but not for the right reasons. Ali John examines they died with their boots on. Cavalry regiment the world has ever known. They died with their boots on captures General Custer's military career, from his early successes to his tragic fate at Little Bighorn. See their flag crumpled in defeat, all under the flaming command of the man they'd follow straight to Hades. One of Hollywood's biggest stars at the time, Errol Flynn, donned Custer's boots. And the equally bankable Olivia de Havilland became Mrs. Custer. How did this fellow get into my house? In the 1930s, Flynn and de Havilland were turned into an on-screen power couple under Michael Curtiz's direction in such classics as Captain Blood and The Adventures of Robin Hood. There can be no explanation for your rowdy, insulting conduct. Certainly none that's fit for the ears of my innocent daughter. Fifth and sixth Michigan are formed for attack. Are there any orders? But with They Died With Their Boots On, Flynn wasn't matched up with Curtis. Instead, he got action director Raoul Walsh. In front of the attacking regiment. Walsh's cavalry fight sequences received high praise. But as the New York Times put it, he was not so fortunate in handling the personal drama aspect of the picture. I was hoping you'd say that, ma'am. Tell me, uh, have you always lived in this big house? Yes, why? And worse yet, the movie put an end to Flynn's cinematic courtship with de Havilland. She was reportedly sick of playing the girl, and there was falling out prior to filming. Later, de Havilland said they both knew it would be their last picture together. Oh, yeah. What is it? I don't see how I can smell those onions all the way from the kitchen, but... Onions? Onions? It's funny, I don't smell them. Don't you like onions? Oh, I, I love them. I just thought that maybe you didn't like them. That's enough. I'll gamble. Off camera, Flynn's reputation soured after two girls accused him of statutory rape. Good name. While he was later acquitted, his Hollywood star would never shine as bright, and neither would his draw at the box office. It's a big reason why They Died With Their Boots On has become more associated with the dark side of Hollywood rather than the downfall of Custer. What did the sharps want of you, George? Only my name for stuff. 
Istanbul's Meşer Gallery has found dozens of female artists whose names were erased from artistry. Nur Sena went to see the attempt made to give these artists the recognition they deserve. A wife of a painter, a fine arts student, a relative of a man, women whose dates of birth and death were lost. They're all artists who are forgotten among their male peers between the artistry books. Istanbul's Meşar Gallery attempts to correct this negligence. The exhibition I, You, They, a century of artist women, displays more than 200 works by 117 artists. And although some of the names such as Farhan Nisa Zaid are famous, most of these women's works have never been exhibited before now. So one of the objectives of this exhibition is to uh, point out this, let's say, hidden treasures to researchers, art historians or uh, scholars who are working, who are specializing on uh, women's studies to conduct more research, uh, detailed research on these names and uh, come up with new finds. And the way Mesha reintroduces these artists is a three-layered experience. Three themes are spread over three floors, examining the identity of a woman artist in the society. In the early 20th century, American sociologist Charles Cooley came up with a concept called the looking glass self. It's about how we think others see us and the identity we build according to those assumptions. This exhibition examines the different layers of perception and how the artists build their own identity. On the first floor is an expression of the self. It's called I. Self-portraits and mirror images adorn the gallery walls. Women trying to be seen through artworks. Basically, the first floor uh, focuses on the uh, artist women who is kind of discovering or rediscovering herself through images, through mirrors, uh, through reflections. Uh, reflection is one of the themes, one of the topics that we are uh, investigating in this floor. We, we are seeing the model or the artwork uh, basically discovering herself. The second floor, you, is much more intimate. Here, the theme of motherhood is both taken literal and metaphorical. For instance, there are books about an artist's motherland. Core curator Sotudia says they have taken the land as a maternal symbol. Uh, in this floor, the artist woman uh, basically recognizes uh, her very close environment. So this view is very soft and gentle and it calls for the children first, the children of the artist women, let's say or her very clo close relatives, like mother, father. So we see, uh, the, for instance, we see portraits of a mother and her, uh, her daughter, like side by side. And uh, this floor opens with uh, a portrait of uh, Deniz Bilgin, uh, which is called Madonna and the Child. So the first artwork that the uh, visitors see is you know, uh, directly linked with the motherhood, the issue of motherhood. And finally, on the third floor, is they. It has a Brechtian, in-your-face quality of how society sees women. Women are, us are usually associated with the adjectives like, uh, of course, feminine, gentle, vulnerable, fragile, domestic, um, fancy, maybe beautiful. And uh, therefore, the final floor, the third floor of the exhibition, uh, is full of uh, flower images. It's a commentary on how female artists have always been expected to create in the art world. Interior settings, children, food and plants have been some of the more domestic themes these artists have been expected to paint. And Meshar's day floor almost mocks this expectation with a room full of floral art. And then there's the dark gallery room. It's crammed with dozens of artworks. 
Sotheby's says it's meant to create a claustrophobic atmosphere to depict how society limits the imagination of women. We want the visitors to think, uh, you know, why these women, uh, you know, paint, usually paint, not always, but usually paint flowers. We are actually uh, inviting people to a thought experiment. If, if uh, all the, you know, artist women were given the chance, or if they weren't uh, overlooked at the time, what would uh, the artistry writing be today? The exhibition aims to resurface what has been swept beneath the carpet. The co-curator says they're challenging classical history, and she adds that they're trying to magnify these artists' works and display them in a way that should have been done long ago. Meshar through Are You They continues to set the art history books right until March. Norsen Atutar, TRT World, Istanbul. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter accounts have more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Elif Bereketti. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.